Hello, good morning. How are you? Somewhat caffeinated now? Somewhat fed? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, the bagels are warm. Uh, they're straight out of a taxi cab, so we had them right on the engine block. Uh, hi, my name is Noel, or Noel, he, him, uh, executive director of Beta NYC. Uh, thanks for coming to our fourth Beta Bagels, uh, co-hosted with the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Uh, and today we are featuring NYC 311 uh, and members of their team to talk about really the future of NYC 311. Um, so uh, if you are on the internet, um, which I assume that's how you found out about this event, unless you uh, live in the building and saw one of our flyers, uh, our primary hashtag is beta bagels, plural. Um, so don't do the 004, just beta bagels, plural. Uh, anything like that, I will see on Twitter. Uh, as I also said, uh, we are taking questions through this really cool tool called Slido. Um, and if you want to start uh, um, putting in questions, uh, please use the bit.ly, uh, bit.ly forward slash beta bagels, plural 004, 004, excuse me. Um, so welcome, thanks for coming to the Manhattan Borough President's Office on uh, this beautiful, fine, muggy day. Uh, happy midsummer, everyone. Uh, how many of you have not been to a Beta NYC event before? Good. Uh, let's do a little, a few Q and A. How many of you work uh, or are a government contractor that are in the room? Please raise your hand. A work for government or a government contractor? Raise your hand again. I just want to make sure that I see them. Okay, so a handful. Uh, how many of you have used three one one once? All right, good. Uh, let's see. Let's keep those hands up again. How many of you have done uh, two service requests? All right, how about 10 service requests? All right, 20, 30, uh, over 50. Okay, good, good. We got some dedicated users in the room. Uh, how many of you are excited about the new 311 platform? All right, uh, how many of you didn't know about the new 311 platform? Okay, great. Well, uh, all of those questions are gonna be answered today. Um, so just to contextualize uh, what we do at Beta NYC, uh, looking at New York City's history, we have discovered that there is uh, the Lenape, uh, who were one of the tribes in this very, very beautiful area, uh, had a belief that when they, when the, the Dutch had a hard time understanding, uh, and the Dutch were the colonizers, and we are, and we do respect the fact that we are on occupied soil. Um, that and it is quite miraculous that we're able to exist in this space um, a, as immigrants and migrants coming here and live off the bounty of this land. And what's amazing is that the the Lenape and the Canarsi and the the Rockaway all had this belief that if you can't own the land, well, if you can't own the air and you can't own the water, how can you own the land? And so at Beta NYC, we've internalized this as something as we are the stewards. We recognize that we're on a series of islands. You know, this is the archipelago of New York City. Uh, we are constantly dealing with the ramifications of climate change, and we're definitely heading into a climate crisis. Uh, we are a city of immigrants and migrants, uh, and that the city is constantly evolving. Uh, and so we're here as stewards for the future, uh, and we bake that into all of our operations when we think about how technology, data, and design can improve uh, New York City's operations in general, whether it's from civil society or from the government side. Uh, we fundamentally also believe that this wall that was created, uh, I, aka Wall Street, should be torn down. That there, we live in a society without walls, uh, we are all migrants and immigrants, um, and so we should embrace that universe and embrace that world. And that's what we put into our, uh, our uh, operations. Beta Bagels itself is an experimental breakfast salon uh, for change makers and doers. Um, and what we like to do, and since this is only our fourth one, is that we take, like to take a look at issues that are on the horizon and demystify them so that way you know, we can all internalize them. 
we record them, we put them up on the internet, um, so that way there's a socialization of the changing elements of the city's technology data and design. Our four values that our organization carries forth through all of our programming that came from the People's Roadmap is the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. And so that itself is underpinning this particular conversation. And once again, these are our four values that we carry forward in all of our work. Uh, Beta Bagels itself is inspired by a really great uh, uh, event that happens in LA, Data and Donuts. Uh, they do the exact same thing. They get a bunch of nerds who are inside of government and outside of government. They meet up for coffee and donuts and they talk about stuff. Uh, they have a really great video if you're interested in micromobility, aka scooters, bicycles, and all of that thing that seems to be like the small uh, um, one of mammals in the prehistoric dinosaur era right now. Um, uh, they have a really great video that talks about the data standard that several cities are coming together to talk about, particularly LA. Here in New York, the data micromobility data standard is represented by the TLC, uh, which is something that's quite interesting. Um, but I would check out data uh, donuts.la um, for their uh, amazing conversations that they talk about. Uh, we also want to give a thanks to Microsoft and the Alpha P. Sloan Foundation uh, for supporting uh, Beta NYC's activities and particularly this particular event. Um, so once again, if you have any questions, please go to bit.ly forward slash beta bagels plural 004 uh, and ask questions on Slido. Uh, that's if you want to stay anonymous. If you want to uh, have your voice uh, on the internet, We'll have a question and Q&A session where you can ask that. Uh, in the meantime, I would love to bring up Jessica, uh, who is the Chief of Staff for Gail Brewer, one of our co-hosts, um, to welcome you here to this event. So please, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Um, welcome to the office of the Manhattan Bar President office where the coffee free, freely flows. Both the coffee today is thanks to Beta NYC, but we frequently have coffee here. Um, it's very um, exciting for us to have these kinds of events. Gail Brewer, um, Borough President, is a big tech person, for those who don't know her. Um, she was, through a series of um, events, made chair of the City Council's Tech Committee many years ago. Didn't know anything about tech. No one really cared about the Tech Committee, and she decided to really do something with it and make it into a meaningful committee and she started looking at you know idea around open data and actually passed the first open data law um, but she can has continued to be very involved in technology and she attends lots of events she goes to hackathons all over she goes to forums and conferences so we're always very happy to be able to host in this case co-host a, a technology event because um, it's really meaningful to get into this office um, I'm, we're very very um, delighted to work with beta NYC and I just have to say our, our relationship with Beta NYC has evolved. Um, we work closely with them. Um, and, uh, we first started working with Beta NYC in the Borough President's Office. Um, my knowledge of the situation was that there were some smart people who were doing something with data in our North Conference room. And I thought, OK, great. I have no idea what that is, but sounds good and seems like they're doing good work. Um, I quickly um, started to learn more a little bit about what that work was, and it became really meaningful for us. So they started working with CUNY students, which is great. We love interns and do a lot of work with um, young people here. They started working with our community boards and developing tools, and I realized they were really useful tools. So they developed something called BoardStat, where they could um, help community boards parse 311 data in ways that would be really helpful to community boards and looking at types of complaints and where and how often and things like that. Um, they developed a tool called SLAM, which our community boards get inundated with people who want liquor licenses. And this is a tool you can use to look at you know, various pieces of liquor licenses that, uh, that, that exist. So I started seeing these tools, and I thought, great, this is actually really useful to our community boards and to us. Um, and then um, you know, I started realizing, well, there's a lot of information that Beta NYC can help us um, you know, uncover and, and work with to really inform our work. So you know, looking at something like after hour variances in the city, you know, where's all this, uh, why is construction going on 24-7? We were able to get data and actually you know, make some headway there. Um, so we're looking at churches now and trying to figure out, you know, religious institutions, which ones are kind of very vulnerable to development, and Beta NYC has been able to help us figure out what's the data out there that can help us identify those vulnerable sites. So 
relationship kept evolving. And what I've realized lately, and I think this leads to the conversation today, is that a lot of what is really helpful to the work that we do in the borough president's office is actually the conversation about the data. So, you know, good, good, good example was we recently formed a task force in the borough president's office to look at the issue of helicopters, because we just get complaints, complaints, complaints. There's too many helicopters, they're noisy, we don't like them, you know, we're in the park or wherever. And, um, and then, of course, there was the, you know, really um, tragic crash that happened recently. So, you know, my first instinct was I say to, you know, Beto, I say, well, you know, can we just get information about, you know, complaints about helicopter noise? So that seems pretty straightforward. But then when I spoke with, I guess I think it was Emily at the, at the time, started asking a lot of questions. Well, what type of complaints? Which type of helicopters? Really, are you looking at takeoff and landing? Are you looking at the water? Are you a series of questions that really did help inform what we were trying to do with this task force. Um, you know, there's information from 311 about complaints, and then there's FAA information that we found out that we could also get that was, you know, available to us that we could look at the types of flights that we're actually talking about. Are we talking about charter flights or tourist flights or? police flights, you know, I mean, every start, the questions they asked were great. So that conversation really led to, you know, what we could do better um, in this task force and how we could really inform the work of, of dealing with the issue of helicopters. Um, similarly, um, as people may have seen recently, uh, the borough president was able with the speaker and other, uh, council member Rosenthal to pass legislation, thanks um, in large part to Daniel, who's our tech person who's here today, mm -hmm. Daniel, um, uh, to, to look at the issue of empty storefronts, in uh, vacant storefronts in New York City. Um, we need to look at solutions about how we, you know, don't end up with the vacant storefronts, but first we have to find out what's the extent of the problem. So, you know, my, again, my instinct was, well, let's just, you know, get some data around empty, you know, vacant storefronts. Let's just collect it and people report it and then we know vacant storefronts, but of course it's more complicated than that. You know, what kind of storefronts, where, how often, how does the reporting happen, do you just say it's a storefront or do you have to give square feet, you know, all the kinds of conversations that you have about something like a vacant storefront really did inform the work of this, what ended up being a piece of legislation moving forward. So now I think we're in a good spot, you know, we know who's collecting the data, we know what data they're collecting, and we know what we're going to be able to do with it once we get a handle on, on, on the vacant storefront situation. So all that to say, um, our relationship with Vade NYC has evolved. My thinking and knowledge about data and its uses has certainly evolved. And I like to think that it's really, um, our whole office has evolved because of these conversations and this relationship with Beta NYC. So I'm very excited that, you know, these conversations are continuing, that the audience has grown, and that, um, you know, we're really looking at, at the various ways and places where this data and the way we're going to be able to use it all. So i um, looking forward to, to today. And um, again, welcome to the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Thank you. So with that, I want to give a shout out to Emily, who's in the back, who's been working with our, she's the director of Civic Innovation Fellows Program, uh, been working alongside uh, myself for the last four years to help bring up uh, the quality individuals that are also represented in the room. So you were checked in uh, by uh, Anderson, Anita, Siobhan, and Ellie, and Amy. Where are you? Can you, if you're in the room, just... Stand up. All right. Uh, these are our amazing uh, CUNY uh, 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 Service Corps fellows. Uh, if you're a CUNY or if you know somebody in CUNY, have them take a look at the CUNY Service Corps. Uh, it's a really great work study program. If you want to uh, have more questions about it, please see them. Uh, and then we, over the summer, uh, take on uh, special uh, interns. Uh, so Ellie is coming through from the Nighting Nightingale School. Right, um, and so if you have summer, so that's a high school student, right? Um, so we, we, we work with the Manhattan Borough President's Office to find young talent uh, to bring that in. I also give recognition to Alex, uh, who's on our leadership team and has been helping put together our newsletter, uh, and Devin, a partner uh, who's been helping put together uh, CBDB, which is a community board database. Uh, um, so a database for community boards. And then actually one thing that we should also recognize is Lindsay, who's over here on the Skype, uh, who's this little box over here, uh, worked with us. She's an anthropologist and worked with us last summer uh, and really did a lot of the, the foundations to build SLAM, build out tenants map, 
um, uh, boundaries map some of our tools that we have and did the 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 data research the informed research that helped build uh, the the foundations for the vacant storefront legislation um, so thanks Lindsay um, and she's here going to be joining in the conversation so now uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to bring up Chenda, who uh, has been an amazing partner um, uh, over the last few years of helping improve New York City's 3 in 1, no, uh, 3 in 1 and the 3 in 1 data set. So she is the receiving end of my complaints and saying, oh, all this data is screwed up. And she's like, yeah, give me a bigger problem. Uh, uh, but. Uh, we are so fortunate in New York to have a dedicated civil servant, civil servant uh, like Chenda and her whole team at 311 who's really in the business of solving our collective problems and building platforms to help us address those problems. Um, so Chenda, thanks for coming here and talking about the future of 311. Uh, and that little arrow will help you move forward. This one in the middle? The one on the right. There you go. Oh. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. I have some notes, but I'm probably not going to look at them. So um, thanks for coming out. My name is Chenda Fructor. I'm the Director of Strategy and Development at New York City 301. I am also the uh, agency's Open Data Coordinator, which is a role in the city at every agency to make sure that we are offering open, uh, our data openly and in a useful way. Um, and that's coordinated by my colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, some of whom are here. Uh, I also have some colleagues from 301. Andres is going to be taking pictures for us and posting them all kinds of places. Um, and some uh, folks from Do It, which is the city's information technology agency, are also here. So they're going to help me out. Um, am I standing? Where you yeah, yeah, you're standing in the right spot. Um, so I think th there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, not I think, there will be. Uh, so Noel stole a little my thunder. How many people are familiar with 301? Raise your hand. Yes. Um, how many people have used our open data? Oh, okay. And for those who have your hands up, I'm always curious. Um, I'm, have, is that the service request data you're using? We actually have multiple complaints. Yes. Okay. Um, did you use it as a student? Yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Okay. Um, in your paid job? Okay, um, and then everything else is your hobbies, your entrepreneurs. Okay, interesting. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little about 311, uh, just because we have to do that to set the ground, but um, I will keep that short. So if you have a question about how we work and everything, I guess we'll do those at the end. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, so I actually have been at 301 launched in 2003 under uh, Mayor Bloomberg. I joined 301. Uh, right before we launched. Um, so I've been there since 2003. I've had multiple roles, which helps explain why I know a lot about how different things work. Um, so yeah, that's who I am. Uh, so I shaved this down to 43 million. Joe had 44. Uh, 43 million customer contacts. This is in 2018. A contact for us means any interaction with the customer. That could be a 301 call center agent talking to you on the phone. It's inputting your service request. It could be you listening to the uh, automated outgoing message that tells you about alternate side parking every day. So it goes from a very heavy touch to very light touch, 43 million contacts. This is how that breaks down. And um, for those of you, well, so a contact for us is a customer inquiry. Again, a lot of people think of 301s everywhere as, oh, that's a complaint hotline or that's a complaint system. Yes, we do that. That's a, a part of what we do. Um, these are our different channels. Uh, this is basically three things can happen when you have an interaction with 301 and this is more how we think about it than customers need to think about it but it just helps to organize the data that we're going to talk about um, number one is you have a question you get the answer to your question can i have a barbecue on my fire escape no you can't um okay done you got that from our website you got it from an agent you got it from google or that landed somewhere um, the second thing is a referral and that's when we send you to someone else to answer your question. That's either on the phone, when we send you to another website outside of New York City. And for us, that means outside of the city of New York. When we started, uh, the scope was uh, any question for the city of New York, any piece of information. We found very quickly, this was not intended particularly, but we found very quickly that customers don't differentiate types of government. They actually barely differentiate between 301 and 401 and 911. Um, 
But because so many functions uh, are actually handled by the feds or the state, um, we started building out that content because we wanted to be able to answer customers' questions and we want to get our city agencies customers to the right city agency. And even though there is a city department called the Department of Consumer Affairs, they're not the ones that license nail salons and manage complaints about nail salons. So we tried to figure all that out so that you don't have to. Um, and that's what a referral is. If we send you off to the state to figure out about your nail salon complaint, that's a referral. Uh, a service request is what we all know and love from the data. That's a uh, request or complaint that uh, is taken at 311. You input it at 301 in whatever channel. And uh, it is routed to a city agency to respond to. And they respond in the way that they do their process. They update the service request. And that information gets back to the consumer. Um, We'll talk more about how that works maybe when we talk about that data set. Do you want me to take questions on that? You don't. Yeah, um, what the leader, can when we you talk about, excuse me, sorry. Channels, that's all. Uh, can we wait for the, the questions Please. at the end? OK. Thanks. Um, so out of 44 million contacts, um, imagine in your head how those break down across these three channels for a moment. This is actually how they break down. The information provided is a, a little over 80% of all of that 43 million. Um, the referral is about 10%, um, and then the service request is less than 10%. So while there's a lot of rows in that table that you guys are looking at, and it is definitely our most uh, complex and intense interaction. Oh, is that true? Actually, maybe not. Um, it's a very small part of what we do. So all that to say, 301 is a big operation. There's a lot of folks, um, a lot of technology, a lot of information, and uh, just, yeah, they give you a bigger picture. Um, I'm going to wing it. So our open data. Uh, I was going to go to the data, but um, we have, let me, so we have multiple. This is the open data portal. You all know that, right? That's where you go all the time to see what's <laughs> happening. Um, we have multiple data sets on the open data portal. I think we were one of the f uh, first. I always think we're one of the first. But anyway, we're the biggest. We're the shock and awe. We're the, you know, the most rows, the most used. Um, so this is, uh, can we do inquiries first? Uh, sure. Uh, I think the most voluminous, yes. maybe, yeah. Data set we have is call center inquiry. Um, call center inquiry is a very uh, light data set, light in terms of the information in each row. It's a record of when you call, has anyone called through one? Wow, okay, yeah, why are you calling? Use, use the app or the <laughs> website. Um, <laughs> When you call 301, you get an, uh, some messaging up front. Um, it directs you for language, and then we force you to listen to information about alternate side parking, whether you want to hear it or not. But most everybody does. So uh, for those of you who don't, you're, in, you're suffering. Um, and then we have an a interactive system where we can route you outside. For example, uh, um, hopefully more people know because of politics in the last few years, the MTA is not actually part of the city. The subways, the buses are not controlled by the mayor. So um, if you have a question or more often a complaint about the MTA, we will try to route you through that um, tele interactive system directly to uh, <coughs> the MTA without speaking to one of our agents. So. This data set is all of the calls that get through that, that reach an agent. This is a data set. This is the record of an agent in the call center speaking with a customer. Um, and that is about, I have Bill here to help me. We have about 20 to 60,000 calls a day average, 50,000 average, and maybe 20,000 of those uh, are speaking to an agent. So. Um, it is not, as an indicator, it's not the majority of interactions at 301. It is definitely an indicator of something, but uh, I leave that to people to uh, explicate the data so that we can understand what that something is. Um, so what do we have here? Has, does anyone use this data set? No, nobody does. I don't it's so it's big. too big. What 75 kind of million rows. Come on, all you guys want is data, and then it's too big. Um, so, uh, it has the date of your call, the time of your call, the date and time together, because somebody asked us for that at some point. It makes it easier. Yeah, someone's nodding. Yeah. Um, agency, agency name, the inquiry name, that's a topic. Um, this is actually from, directly from our content. This is a brief description of what that inquiry covers. This can be useful for you in your uh, service request work, because it gives you an explanation of the topics. And it's, it's short. It's usually two, a sentence or less. Um, 
So if you're looking for context to make sense of our data, which almost everybody has to do, um, this is actually a good place to look. Um, the inquiry name isn't going to match perfectly to the complaint information in the service request, but if you want to dig around a little, you can usually make those associations. Oh, um, and call resolution, and that's the last column, right? Yeah. Okay. Why well, is call resolution agency name and in, 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 agency blank? I'm good. Okay. Um, so we recently had a huge um, upgrade, really uh, replaced our entire back end software, which was a host of systems together that were all unsupported, end of life, like standing on a ladder with gums and sticks <laughs> and um, with a new system. And as a result, our open data has changed slightly. The, the structurally hasn't changed, but you will see some changes in the data set itself. Because um, we, because Moda and Doit, and we give you this data going through time to make it valuable, we opted not to package them up and sort of start a new data set, but leave the columns, leave the, the impact of that change can be seen in the data itself. And I was going to talk about that. I'll talk about it here because we're looking at it. Um, and you're not, the filtering is going to be slow, I'm guessing. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, so if you look before uh, 628, 2019, those rows will be populated. Um, in inquiry, the three ones you saw, which is, you don't have to, just leave it, it's fine. It's fine. Here? Uh, yeah, totally. Okay. Agency, agency name and call resolution are now blank. If you look before June 28th, you will see them populated. We changed the structure of our content and that change flowed through to the data that we produce. Um, it's not meaningful, except that we changed the system at that point, um, but that's something just for you to know. Uh, can I, well, we can come back to here if people have questions about this data set. Uh, the next data set, which is probably the one you're all using, is the actual live, oh, I was going to say, here, I did have a, yeah, so what's interesting about the inquiry data set, again, it's an indicator, it's an indicator of something. I, I happen to think it hasn't been used enough for people to, act, to figure out what it's a useful indicator for, so I would charge you all with that. Um, as far as city agencies and government folks, and Bill knows this well, uh, it is a data point people have, so people will use it. Oh, my city hall, they want to know how many people called about abandoned pets, you know, and, and when you look at this data set, you'll get to that. Again, it's a, it's a cut of the data that is a cut of the interactions. But if abandoned pets was quadruple the volume one day than it had been ever before, that indicates something. Um, so, you know, that's what it's useful for. What's not in there, what it's not useful for is geodata is not in there. You can't map it. You can't call Noel, who will then call me when, and ask, like, can we have the geodata that goes with this? It's not geodata. Um, there's no customer data in there, and it's not comprehensive of all our interactions. So that's what's not in there. But I do think it's juicy if uh, somebody does the right thing with it. Um, service request data, that's the one. That's why you're all here. Um, Service requests, again, that less than 10% volume that we have, uh, where uh, through 301, you submit a complaint to a city agency. That is a very structured process. You can't just send us a picture and we'll derive everything from there. Um, uh, it gets routed to the city agency. That city agency may be using the system that we use, which currently and recently is Microsoft Dynamic CRM. Uh, they may be using that and they have their own view and their own capabilities in that and they actually are getting the ticket, interacting with the system, updating it, doing all their work offline but reflecting that work in that system and that system is their system of record for handling 301 complaints. That's one group. There's another group that's using their agency system and we uh, pass them the tickets through an integration and when they're, it should work the same way where they're updating the tickets in their legacy system, reflecting their work that they're doing in the field and those updates are flowing back to us. Um, and that's basically the two classes of how things happen. From, uh, yeah, once, once the ticket, can you scroll? So, so what's interesting about the SR data? No, what's interesting about the SR data? Uh, everything. Uh, everything. Uh, the unique ID, the geo, the complaint type, the descriptor, uh, the resolution description field itself, um, status. Yeah. Lots of people find it interesting for lots of things, um, especially making maps. Um, it does have the geo information, so uh, lots and lots of people who take data visualization classes use it and they make awesome looking maps. Um, 
lots of people use it because it's very rich and they use it just for learning about data. Lots of uh, schools use it. Um, lots of people in the city use it. Lots of people within city government use it to, to learn things about what's going on. And then lots of people everywhere seem to use it. Um, and Noel is the best example of using it um, to do your civic work. Um, what's interesting about it? Could, do, you, do I have to keep No, 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 I'll keep on. You just tell me what to do. I'll be your uh, Let's go back to the beginning. OK. Um, this is just some fundamentals. This unique key is not the service request number you get when you make a complaint to 301. When you make a service request to 301, you get a unique ticket number. You can then use that ticket number to get status. When the agency is looking at your ticket, for the most part, if they're using our system, they're seeing the same number. When Bill is looking something up, when I'm doing something, we're looking at the same number. That number, when 301 was established, when 301 was established in 2003, it was a different time, and it was the, the structure was very focused on privacy. Um, so that it was decided at that point that that number was only for the person who had created the ticket and that you could only get status on that ticket if you called up with that exact number and that number wasn't shared. So when we launched the service request open data, which was 2000 and... No, I, I mean, it was one of the first... Al, when was the, when was the data first published? Uh, 2011. Oh, here we go. However, the open data director from Do It, right? Did I get your title right? Um, so this is a unique key. It's a, it's a number we produce and put on the open data. Um, so it doesn't tie you back to anything else except it ties the ticket to the actual ticket. Um, I'm not a technologist, as you can tell. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the columns, okay. but I'm happy to answer any questions about any columns. Um, what's changed? Uh, oh, so what's interesting about this, what it has, I said, what it doesn't have, doesn't have any customer information, nor will it ever. If everybody wants it, you know, that's again, that's not something we're going to provide. There's not a public interest in knowing who the customers are who, who made these requests. And even if there are, that weighs, t you know, too much on the side of the privacy of those people. Um, what's not in it? Uh, I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to ask later. Um, so uh, what's changed? So again, we worked very, well, I won't say very, we worked deliberately not to change the structure of this with the deployment of our new system. So we, the columns are all the same. We have a couple cases where there's now no value in it. Um, those are, I think, less consequential than the null values in the other data set. But since most people use this data set, it may, is therefore more consequential. Um, the address type is now null. The address type in the past, and again, you can see what it was by just looking before June 28th, probably at something like street, sidewalk. No, address type is address, block face, or intersection. Um, and then the due date is now blank. The due date is blank because we changed the slightly the structure of how we do that information. Uh, Content-wise, there's still a due date. Service request still, every service request has a, t a time frame it needs to be fulfilled in. For us, that's called a service level agreement or an SLA. Um, and that definitely still exists. We're just not putting the due date in because of how the system calculates time or doesn't. Uh, you can still get that presumably from the resolution description. These are just coming in, so they're no nobody's done anything with these yet, which is why they're blank, but if you looked further, um, anyway, you should still be able to, I'm not going to say, I, I don't know if you can still derive when it's due. I have to look into that. Um, so again, structurally nothing's changed. You will see some uh, uh, null columns now and uh, you will easily see that those were populated previously and now are not. Um, what has changed, there's no changes to the structure. There are some changes to the data that's included. That's primarily because of the way that we were excluding data previously was sort of ad hoc and as it came up and not that comprehensive. And now it's being done in a more comprehensive way. So that's what I'll say about that. Um, and yeah. You want me to go back to the slides? Let's go back to the slides. How am I doing? Oh, I can hurry up even. So the next slide just says, what's next for us? Um, we are still uh, 
active reeling from our deployment, which was June 28th. Um, it's a huge change for us. It's a huge change for the city agencies we work with. Um, and we're still, we're six weeks out of deployment. We're doing a lot of hot fixes. We're figuring out what goes into releases. We're figuring out how to work with the new system um, and all of the aftermath um, of being, well, really being in this new world. Um, the deployment went extremely well. I've been, worked on the deployment. This is, I hope, something you can only do in government. I worked on the deployment for seven years. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the actual deployment was about, the actual project was about two years and we just went live. Um, so, um, it works. <laughs> um, it's, uh, to me, very successful, but it's a lot of change and it's a lot of change for a lot of different organizations and groups. So, we're, that's still shaking out. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know when that's going to end. Um, so stabilization of bug fixes, we're definitely in that mode. We're six weeks out. I'm going to guess we'll be in that mode for at least a year. Um, update a better documentation. This is specifically about the open data. I'm on the hook to uh, do that. Um, my colleague Alex is here who has to send me the emails from when people ask for things and that's definitely a frequent one. So um, I think I probably need to update the data dictionary and um, I know I have to update the data dictionary, that's about it. Um, and then I think just from conversations with the users and the community as well as Moda, you know, there's a lot more, anyone who use, has used a data set knows there's a lot more information that would be helpful. Um, so I have sort of a long-term plan to get to some of that and that's something everybody just keeps. First of all, we, that's a gap that needs to be filled. Some of that can be filled by me, but a lot of it can be filled by others. So that's sort of on the general goals. Um, more data sets and APIs. Uh, we have a whole new content structure um, and we are gonna make that content available as a data set. That is awesome. The content is, uh, we have about five full-time and you could extend that to 15 or 20 people who work on the content so that it's comprehensive, covers what the city does and doesn't do and is written clearly uh, in plain language at a seventh grade level so that it can be easily understood and translated. Um, so that's something we're gonna make available which is gonna enable um, people to use that. I hope lots of people build cool things with it. You could filter it just by the content you're interested in, um, but it's its its own unique product that we're very proud of. Um, that'll include categorization of the content which is lacking with the server sequest data, so. Um, we have a lot of information about sites in the city, uh, parks, schools. Um, that's something I'm interested in making available. There are other folks in the city also working on that type of data. So I don't know if we are gonna do that, you know, if I'll be adding to theirs. That's the Department of City Planning Facility Database. Um, but that's something where I feel like we have interesting data that we wanna share. Um, the, one of the most exciting things about the project, the deployment for me is um, from the beginning, seven years ago when I wrote the initial um, request for services for the contractors, which is how you get technology work done in the city. Um, in that was uh, the requirement to produce APIs so that external developers can write uh, service requests to our system. Um, that's something that users have wanted for a long time. And uh, so it's in there, we built it, awesome. Um, and we had folks from different user groups um, sort of beta that a little bit for us and play around with it. Um, that is not yet launched, but it's coming and I'm excited about that. And if that's all you wanna talk about, we can do that when we get to the questions. Um, and then Noel actually asked me some questions about this, but I could go on and on about the deployment, which is not that interesting. Um, but so the, the high level is we are now on a, on a modern, more you know, application where we can make changes, make improvements, do interesting things without, you know, no, it, I'm gonna say quickly, quickly for government, which isn't the same as for the rest of you, but quickly. Um, and so the potential for that to impact the work that you guys do and certainly to impact the data that we produce is large. So I think that um, it's a whole new day for us and I don't know specifically how that will impact what you folks are doing, but I would expect it to impact the data. Um, that's all. So, uh, what can I tell you? Great. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna step 
so the first question, if you want to ask, again, if you want to ask anonymously, please go to this bit.ly. Uh, um, and uh, please try to ask questions uh, around the technology infrastructure, the data. Um, we do have two questions in here that are very specific about 3-in-1 that I will make sure gets passed along to 3-in-1 independently from this uh, uh, question um, platform. So uh, please keep your questions relevant. The first question that's relevant uh, is coming from Tomas in Amsterdam. Oh. Uh, which are the opportunities with machine learning uh, to optimize the through-in-one process, and are you open to collaborating with civic techies and other cities on open source components? Uh, the first question, what, what are the opportunities of machine learning to optimize yep. processes? Um, yeah, those are big. We uh, did a partnership with the CUSP program, which is a center for urban science and progress. They have a master's in data analytics. It's extremely intense. I don't know how people do it. but. Um, they wanted, they took a couple years of our data and fed it into their machine, which I always think of like doing that, um, and came up with a predictive model of where heat complaints would happen based on our data as well as data about landlords. Um, so that's my best example. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I think that what we, what we hope, what we look for from the larger data using community is pointing out things to us that you know we need to look into now sometimes those things aren't actually you know it's a problem with the data or it's a problem with city operations it's not necessarily an opportunity to optimize processes but sometimes they are so um, that's I think where machine learning can do some interesting stuff as long as people are on the right path to figuring you know figuring out what they're trying to solve um, as far as partnering, I don't know. I mean, it's open data, so it's there. You don't need any of us to say we're, we're partners, but I think it's where it comes into clarification um, of the data where we can be helpful. But again, that's something we should do for anybody using it. We don't want to particularly you know, make that in one relationship. Does that answer, Tomas? So uh, uh, it was more along the uh, oh, uh, collaborating with other cities to build the open source components for 311, the underlying tools of Ah, uh, yeah, so there's a standard called Open 311, am I right? Um, and I feel like we are compliant with that in a pretty basic way. Um, this is where we get into New York exceptionalism. We're just more complicated, and that's what makes it so exciting to live here. But uh, my, I think we, we are compliant in a way that, that that is minimal compliance with Open 301. Uh, we're always open to collaborating, but the way that we need to work in order to fulfill what we need to do is not something that we can compromise on. So that's just something to know going into cross city collaborations. There are other cities that have 301. Uh, we take that, you know, we volume wise, we're like overwhelmed those cities very easily. Um, I think for People making products like C Click Fix, we've been working with for a long time. People who want to make products that are usable in multiple municipalities can find working with New York frustrating because our structure is very complicated, but that's part of the challenge. So, um, you know, I think it's definitely possible. Um, and we sort of leave that to the external folks to figure out how to do it. Okay. Uh, questions inside of the room, and if you could just uh, amplify the questions the way they okay. get it. Yes, uh, I am from the in the industrial research and science. Uh, I would like to ask about ownership of data. Like you, 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 you make it open, the data that you have on your portals, but shouldn't the city put some kind of like licensing so that people who can actually profit from them that they shouldn't, or that they should, if they do profit, that they should share with the, with the city? Like some kind of like... Ah. That, I would love that. Um, <laughs> I would like to know when people actually just use our data so that, you know, we can boast about it. Um, I'm going to see if Adrian, is Kelly still here, want to answer that? I mean, I think you want to take a step? Do you, you want to come up? So Sorry, the question was, shouldn't we set up a, couldn't we set up some sort of licensing system so that the city stood to make something when people are using our data for profitable enterprises? Right. Got it. Um, Thank you. 
Um, hi everyone. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm the Deputy Chief Analytics Officer and the Director of Civic Engagement and Strategy for the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, also known as MUDA. Um, I think that it's a really great question. It's one that I think is a point of tension and debate in the you know, open data, public data community. Um, in New York City, we are governed by a series of local laws. I think the original open data law was already mentioned once or twice. Uh, so there's a community of awesome advocates, many of whom are in the room here today, <laughs> Noel and others, um, who helped craft uh, what is known as the open data law. Um, Gail Brewer, it was mentioned, had also helped with this a lot. Um, and the open data law passed in 2012 states that any data set that can be defined as a public data set has to be available on one platform. It is New York City's stance that anyone should be able to use this data for any purpose. You can make money from like an application or a service that uses this data. Um, I think that where we are right now is we've determined that figuring out a revenue stream and the governance of the actual monetization from data streams would be, first of all, a whole governance level and service setup that we're not prepared to take on. And the revenue that would come in, I think, would kind of outweigh those infrastructure costs. And the other piece is that open data exists so there, there's kind of that operational component, but there's the philosophical component too. There are so many different reasons why the open data program exists. It's a data initiative, it's a transparency initiative, but one of the early reasons why it was even developed was as an economic development initiative. How can we make this data available so that companies can actually use it, which will spur job growth? Um, so that is actually one of the fundamental reasons why New York City also publishes data. Um, hopefully that provides a bit more context, but I do think it's something, especially you know, with the advent of IoT and other um, data collection technologies, it's a question that continues to pop up. So I think a discussion and a debate that will continue to be had. Do, do you watermark the, the data so in case, so, so that we know, regardless of the monetization, that, that at least we know that this company used city data like, do you do a uh, watermarking of the... Sorry, what's watermarking? I would like you to, 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 to explain because you uh, you suggested it. I mean, the watermark would be, would be a way that the data set like, is traceable to where it's, it's source. So it's not, and I would state that that's by design. So we want people to be able to use the data however they want without government necessarily having to know how that data was used. Now that does create a tricky dynamic because then from you know trying to understand the return on investment, who are our users, understanding our users, to then be able to optimize the platform and service gets complicated. So we've done qualitative research, interviewing different folks. We have a whole um, report on the website that was created in 2017, uh, developing different user personas. Um, and we do use Google Analytics on the platform to understand volume and those things, but it's definitely not the same as who are the 15 companies in New York City that use open data. Anecdotally, I have a sense of who some of those users are, but it's because they've opted in to getting in touch with the open data team. Great. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, forgive me if this is sort of a basic question, but. Uh, do you guys know yet when you launch the API where you're able to uh, make service requests straight from the API, how that's going to be handled in terms of like authorization or preventing duplicate service requests from being made or like spam of service requests? Yeah, so that um, offering of offering an API that writes a ticket directly to a city system, as far as I know, is totally new for the city. Um, and working with Duet, we're figuring out how to offer that, but it will be some, it will not be like using open data. You're gonna have to register, you're gonna get a key, we're gonna be able to shut that key down if we don't like what you're doing. Um, so that's not gonna be a free for all. Um, realistically, we'll probably pilot it with a couple friendly users that we know, um, but again, the end goal is to get it out, but it would never be offered in the same way that data is offered. Um, so obviously you guys put a lot of effort into having multiple incoming channels for all this, uh, for all the requests. Um, but as with a lot of data, biases around who who submits requests leads to bias in, in analysis of those requests. Do you have any sense of 
um, populations that are over or underrepresented, um, and how that might affect what we, what conclusions we're drawing from it, and then how we might approach as all of this data and ways to write tickets into the system appear, how we as a community might help address some of those. Sure, yeah, um, and that's something, um, you know, predating the current administration, 301 has always been focused on, is are we equally accessible to everybody, and is that accessibility playing out in the usage? Um, one thing we know, for example, uh, in the call center, which is our oldest channel and still uh, quite a lot of our volume, um, we offer service in multiple languages. We have six languages on the IVR, and then uh, you can reach an agent and get a translator. You may you maybe can get a Spanish-speaking agent. Other than that, you can get uh, a translator for up to 180 languages. Um, the overall volume of non-English calls to throw one is tiny, right? It's like under... 10% or something, under 5%, yeah. and the vast majority of that is Spanish. So even, and we know that that does not reflect the population of New York and what people speak in the home. And a lot of our conditions are what about your home, right? So um, that's something we've looked at over time, um, and it's, it, we got a big boost on language with the uh, NYC ID, the ID NYC um, program, and that was uh, interesting. Um, but that's something we'll look at, especially with text, the other channels, trying to figure out if that's coming. So again, that's on the inquiry level. In terms of how the service request data can be used to look at accessibility and usage across the city, uh, I worked with a group from CUSP again in their sort of, um, what's it called, capstone, uh, to look exactly at that. You can get indicators. I mean, there's a lot of data for those of you who work with the planning data. There's a lot of data about New Yorkers out there. So when you transpose the, when you work with the 301 data and look at that, first of all, anybody who makes a map, which probably a lot of you do, you can see the complaints are not evenly distributed. Now, a lot of things aren't equally distributed in New York. So it's, it's quite a bit of work, but there's enough data there to, to, to look at that. Um, and mostly academics that I'm aware of. And again, we don't know who uses our data. So I, I certainly don't have the best view of that. A lot of academics have looked at that. Um, and we looked at it with uh, Mayor de Blasio, because of course this is a huge focus of his and the equity of all the city services that are offered. Um, and we did some targeted work looking at non-English speaking communities, which were primarily immigrant. Uh, they were, the city has looked at public benefits access for those communities and the 301 data was pulled into that. That's hugely chilled thanks to recent um, efforts around receiving public benefits, but um, what did you actually ask me? How can we use the data to look at that? You can absolutely use our data with other city and federal data sets, the uh, community surveys, information about the housing stock, and look at how complaints are distributed across the city and how that matches the demographics of the city. Um, there is context about our data that you need to know. For example, you do need to invest the time to understand what kind of things are taken heat complaints for, what kind of apartments. Um, you need to know that we don't have any data from NYCHA. NYCHA is handled totally outside of 301, so it's, it's wow. uh, analyses around distribution of anything without having NYCHA in there are not representative of, of what's really going on. Um, so I guess you'd have to invest somewhat in learning that context, but that information is there used in conjunction with other publicly available data sets. It hasn't shown, I will say from the work that we've done with academics and look, it hasn't shown huge gaps for us that we feel, it hasn't pointed to something necessary. It, none of it was that stark, without NYCHA again, none of it was that stark and it didn't point us towards something more than what the sort of language indicator had already pointed to, which is, hey, maybe everyone isn't using 301 in the same way, which, again, our response to that is expanding the channels and expanding the, the available points and distributing those points. Um, so yeah, that's what I could say about that. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, I want to answer the question of like whoever asked about like is the platform searchable? Uh, if you go to beta.nyc forward slash classes, you'll actually find the tutorial on how to use the open data portal, which will enable you to search for raccoons, um, such as was the question that you had there. Um, the, um, we're running out of time, so the one question is what is the best example to solve a human or civic problem? If you have a, a quick response to that, and then we're going to do, what are the questions that are out here in the audience? Can you raise your hand who has questions? <coughs> so we got one, one, one. Okay, all right. So give an answer to that, and then we're going to take these two questions, and then that's it. 
Um, I think the, the, the most meaningful examples for me, I'm not gonna say the best because everybody needs different things, right? And um, a lot of people have done amazing things. I think where our open data is really helpful is um, looking at agency response um, and seeing that against what customers are saying in the world and is that satisfying. I also think finding the things that aren't there, um, and Noel and I have, have talked about this a lot, if you find that you can make a, a X complaint about all these different things but you can't make it about this, that's worth talking about, right? Is that because it's some other part of government and it's a referral or is that a service gap where, you know, how do you make a pothole complaints in a bike lane? Like most of the bike stuff has been added because of pressure of that particular advocacy group and like that's how government should work, right? So those those folks have been very effective at getting the conditions they want addressed in the city put into 301 in a meaningful way so that they can access those. The, the problem with 301 is if we don't take the complaint, it's not in the data set. <laughs> um, but that can be an opportunity if, again, you're willing to invest the time in the context to identify an issue that's out there that you don't see here. Why is that? Um, and I guess using that in conjunction with the inquiry data set and our content, once you get to it, you could get more information about that. Great. Let's take these two questions back to Basque, and you can answer them, and then we'll move on to the next section. Good morning. How do we deal effectively with, I guess you would say, multimodal data ingest? So you've got phone calls, and you've got the 311 app, you've got the 311 site. What's the right way to normalize that kind of input, that kind of data input? Okay, do you, and is there then, another and one? And the next one? one, if I had a column of uh, through a one request IDs, could I pull from the API the uh, current status? Um, okay, so let me answer that one first because it's simpler, and I already forgot that one, so I'll have to reset. Um, we have a service request get info API that may be available now or it needs to be available so that with the ticket number you get when you make the complaint, you can pull status. So for partners of ours like Reported who create service requests, they will use that service request, that API to bring the status back to the customer. Um, if you have the open data number, is that your question? Uh, no, just the ticket number. So yes, yeah, the so ticket the number. API that may or may not be available now. No, no, no. The API, the Get Status API will be available. That's just logistics. We have to get up there. It may be available now. For uh, Yeah, the one, the, the right API is the sensitive one where we have to, it's new, we have to figure out how to do it technically, and it's sensitive for the agencies. We have to figure it out bureaucratically. The Get, the get Service Request status, we just have to put it up, and then you'll be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. I don't know what, how many of those. I don't think you can call the entire yeah, data set. Up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep looking at the open data portal or, or talk to Al afterwards about how you sign up to get updates. Um, the first question, which was how do we normalize the data? We've done that for you. Um, we have the same criteria across all the channels that those were all handled separately previously, which is why it takes seven years to, to launch something, is now they're all handled in the same application, um, which is awesome. The service request data set has a field called SR source, and that has about, I hope, about six values, but maybe more like 10 that all tie back to um, call center portal or mobile. We don't have the other channels up there like text and chat because those agents submit them into one of those channels and it's a very small volume anyway. But um, yeah, that information's there. Call center and then? Uh, you have to look at the values, but the, the, the field is called SR source and that will show, tell you what channel that came in. That's a pretty recent addition. Again, something we added from the users asking for it. Um, that's probably interesting, and that's probably interesting along the distribution uh, demographically. Um, are some service request locations overly represented? I mean, some of that is if you're walking on the street, you're probably going to submit something on a mobile app. But um, that hasn't turned out to be true, actually. We, I also um, work on the mobile app, and we added the housing complaints on mobile app, and lots and lots of people use the mobile to make heat complaints, which is we were sort of thinking at the time, you know, oh, that's in your house, you're going to use another channel but um yeah so that we d we've done that work for you because we need to do it for ourselves not because we did it for you but you get the benefit um and the actual last question is and this is a question of personal uh where can we find a listing of city agencies that don't uh that aren't in 311 
uh, I guess you would find the list of city agencies that are in 301 from the data set and then compare that to the list of city agencies on NYC.gov that is somewhere. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, well, let's give a big round of applause.